Welcome to One Bills Light, the quick-hitting version of our daily show, One Bills Live, where we jam-pack everything you need on the Bills in about 40 minutes. Coming up on today's show, we look at the positions that should offer the best value and opportunity for the Bills in round one. I quiz Steve on the history of pick 30 in the numbers game, and NFL Network draft analyst Bucky Brooks offers some interesting takes on the rest of the AFC East's options in the draft as they play catch up with the Bills. Let's break it off! Tasker, touchdown, Buffalo! And it's Steve Tasker who has been all over the field. Kind of unique. He was kind of a dual role player for you. Steve! A balloon. Steve! A blimp? <laughs> We're not even in the stratosphere of normalcy here. Thank you for joining us here on One Bill's Light, available on YouTube and all of your podcast platforms. We are now less than two weeks away from the 2021 NFL Draft, and it's time to look at the Bills pick at 30, Steve, from a different angle. Steve and I have been discussing on The Daily Show what position we believe the Bills will address, but what kind of opportunity might they have to attack their perceived positions of need in round one. To examine this more closely, we took a look at NFL Network Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 prospects. And here is the breakdown, Steve, of the greatest population of players by position ranked 20 to 40 in his top 50. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. So defensive end and offensive line lead the list uh, in terms of most number of prospects between 20 and 40 knowing the Bills pick 30. Uh, Four defensive ends, or edge rushers, whatever you want to term them. Four offensive linemen, uh, three of whom are seen primarily as tackles, although one's kind of a tackle guard guy. Three running backs, three wide receivers, three linebackers, two corners, one defensive tackle, one quarterback, no tight ends or safeties, although I should mention there's a safety that's expected to go in the top 20 somewhere. Uh, Trevon Mooring, I believe. So edge rusher has four players in the 20 to 40 range, Steve, as does the offensive line. So do you see an edge rusher or an offensive tackle as a more likely option in light of Daniel Jeremiah's rankings? Uh, boy, I don't, I, I don't think so. Mostly because you know you're going to get a, re- a good player at 30, um, if not a difference maker. And and, and I think most positions go at least as deep as the Bills needed to go for any of their needs, corner, defensive end, uh, running back, tight end, whatever. Uh, tight end may be a little light, and defensive tackle may be a little light, but I think there's still going to be a player that's going to have a good pro career available at almost at every position where the Bills pick at 30. The question is, can you get a player that's a difference maker on this roster? Uh, it's not the same roster it was two years ago. Yep. It's vastly different. It's not going to be easy for even a high round draft pick to bust in and start on day one. So I'm I'm not really worried about them getting a really quality player at that spot. I still think they can pick the position they want, even if it's not defensive end, even though they're going to be some quality guys. Yeah, and I think we have to remember this too, that Daniel Jeremiah may have four defensive ends that he believes are worthy of a ranking somewhere between right. twenty and forty. That doesn't mean the Bills feel that way. They may only right. like two of those four guys and right. even remotely consider them at 30. So while the population might seem deep at that position, it may not be for the Bills based on the skill set they're looking for to fit their scheme. Same goes for offensive tackle. Um, this is an offense, Steve, that's going to be pass protecting a vast majority of the time. Yes. So if you've got a road grader like Tevin Jenkins, who completely pancakes people in the run game, that's a great skill to have, but – it may not be at the top of the needs right. list at offensive tackle for the Buffalo Bills because you're going to be throwing it 40 times a game. And so I think those are the things that you have to also consider uh, without, without the benefit of having that knowledge of what the Bills deem most important in the qualities of an edge rusher or an offensive tackle. We're forced to rely on people like Daniel Jeremiah to kind of tell us the range of where these players can go. Now, consequently... Three linebackers, three receivers, three running backs on the board, presumably. 
when the Bills are on the clock. We've kind of ruled out running back. At least you and I have. Other people haven't Maybe. yet. Maybe. Not, not at uh, 30. Yeah. There's I've, just no way. I just – neither of us can really see that. And these three names you have on here running – and here's why. ATN, Najee Harris, uh, Williams. Those guys may be there at 60, 61, 64. One, one of them the might be at least. Yeah, one of them might be still be there on the board later in the draft because, because of the position they play. That's the function of the position. Yeah. And receiver doesn't seem like it would be a high priority early in the draft for the Bills. They seem okay there. I know they have two long in the tooth receivers in the form of Emmanuel Sanders and Cole Beasley, who are all who are both on one-year contracts essentially for the 2021 season. And this is a this is a year, Steve, where the receiver class is strong again, but it's strong in a different way. Last year, outside receivers strong. Right. This year's receiver class. Super strong out of the slot, which is going to make for an interesting discussion, I think, later in the draft for the Bills, knowing Beasley's 33 years old in the last year of his contract. But I wanted to talk to you about linebacker. What are your thoughts on linebacker? Because they did bring Milano back into the fold on an extension, and I think it made everybody forget about linebacker. Should we forget about linebacker completely? I don't know if we should come day two, day three, but what about day one? Do we even consider it? Because there's going to be guys in that range that'll be on the board. Here's what you're looking at. If if we do see the Bills take a linebacker, here's what has happened. The landscape has changed around the Bills. We know that the Bills come out, they play two linebackers. Some teams play four linebackers. The Bills play two yeah. predominantly. They got Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano and four defensive, uh, four defensive linemen. Everybody else is a DB. They're nickel a vast majority of the time, and they kind of go, they'll go big nickel. They'll trade out a guy for Taron Johnson will come off and somebody yep. else will come on, or they'll put another player on. Um, the only time we saw them get out of that two linebacker for an entire game was when they played the Baltimore Ravens. Because they run the ball so much. They run the ball so much. But you've got a team in New England that just picked up two quality starting tight ends, and they've got a history of using two tight ends and for the Lions share their – of their offensive set. If you want to match up with them athletically, you're going to have to draft somebody who can do that because there's nobody on this roster except Milano who can do it. And if they play two tight ends, you're down a guy. Uh, if they're going to do that, that would be the reasoning I said, particularly high in this draft. That's what they're looking at. Yeah, and I don't think we can dismiss the fact that with the Dolphins drafting at six now, right. they could – they're at six, right? Yeah. Yes. They could have a shot at Kyle Pitts. Now, what happens, <laughs> so think about this for a second, Steve, okay? As you pointed out, you've got Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry in New England. If the Dolphins draft Kyle Pitts out of Florida, now they have Kyle Pitts and Mike Gesicki. You might need a linebacker. By the time, by the time, the, right. by the time you're at pick 10 in the draft in round one, the Dolphins could have Kyle Pitts and Mike Kosicki, and you know the Patriots have Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry. By the time you're ticking down to 30, you might be like, holy crap, we need a pass coverage and linebacker. Even if none of those teams play two tight ends at a time, what happens if Milano doesn't play all 16 well, games, right, 17 and games? That's been a chore for him at times. You need, you, you got to have an athlete that can yeah. run with those guys. And I know they like Tyrell Dotson, and he, and he flashed yeah. it at times last year, and I think he's a, a good backup to have, but I think he's better backing up Tremaine than he is backing up Milano. So right. do you want to find an athlete at linebacker early in the draft? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject that I don't know if we've covered enough because I think everybody put it on the back burner once Milano signed the extension. Yeah, and it, it'll be interesting to see if there's a guy out there. You know, for instance, a, there are a lot of teams maybe in the same spot as the Bills that are looking for those guys, but now you're seeing a new kind of player elevate in draft boards and even in college um, like Milano. They're not, they're, they weigh less than 230. They're 6'2", 6'3", and they're athletic. So they're a little lighter than the old 250-pound 6'3", right. middle linebacker like Pepper Rogers and Ray Bentley and Shane Conlon and those guys. These guys are safety slash linebackers. There is one exception in this year's draft. It is Tulsa linebacker Zaven Collins. 6'3", 260, runs a 4'7", 
and had a 95-yard interception return for a touchdown. Right. This guy is nuts. 4-7? Four, 4-7 seven. Four, seven at 6'3", 260. Yeah. I mean, that ain't right. Super instinctive player. He can rush and blitz off the edge as well. Some people, because of his size and height, say, ah, he's only a 3-4 outside linebacker. 4-3 right. teams shouldn't even look at him. I don't know if that's the case. And he's a guy that's falling in that range when the Bills are on the clock. Does he get to 30? Probably a good chance he doesn't. But I think linebacker is an interesting consideration that I don't think has been given enough stock after Milano signed the extension. I think everybody forgot about linebacker. I don't know if we can do that. How about corners, Steve? Only two corners in this range of 20 to 40, you know, right in the wheelhouse of where the Bills are going to be considering their options, according to Daniel Jeremiah. So knowing that, I am genuinely concerned that if the Bills would like a corner in this range, they're going to need to move up with only two rated between 20 and 40. Uh, And you researched that the other day, Steve, and I know you found it to be quite costly uh, to move up from like 30 to even 22, you know, move up six to eight spots. Um, It would take... It would take next some of next year's picks to get it done. Yeah, <clears throat> if you bundled all, all five of the bottom five of the seven draft picks for the Buffalo Bills, and you and you hoping to like in the third round when the Bills pick ninety first or something like that. Yeah, ninety third, I think you could take that pick and the second round pick at sixty, and all the other picks put together, you're only moving up half a round. Yeah. Half a round. Like you're going from like 30 and plus the 30th pick. You're you're picking from 30th you're going to 22nd. And then your your day's done for and the And your next day's two done. Days. Your draft is done. Yeah. So uh, and you better so for a guy that was picked outside the top 20. So or outside the top uh yeah, outside the top 20. Yeah. Uh it's just it's not going to happen. So plus costly. the names on this list with J- Daniel Jeremiah. Some of these names I've seen Nan- uh, Newsom for the Northwestern kid. I've seen him picked as high as 15 in some other mock drafts. Yeah. So there could be a different name in this pool. But I think the names that you've got with the you know the four DL, the o- offensive lineman, and all these, there's 20 names on this list. These aren't even the very top top names that include all the quarterbacks and all that. Yeah. Most of these players right here, half of these players are probably going to be there for the Bills, depending on whatever position there's going to be in. <laughs> It is a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces and no well, right. edges to look from. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Let's no start edges. with the edges. There's right? no Don't corner you piece. Do that? There's no corner piece to even look at, right? Yeah. So it is it is a swirl of color in a bucket. I see what you did there. Yeah. Corner piece. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, you are see. clever. Yeah. I wish you're I was even that more clever. clever than you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I think they may have to wait on cornerback, and so I think Bills fans are like, "Oh, got to get a corner in round one." I'm worried that run is going to start on corners early, right around 22, because you got the Titans, the Jets, the Steelers, the Jaguars, all of those the teams. The Colts are up there. All of those teams pick in front of the Bills, and they all need corners desperately. And I, I fear that the run will start so early that the Bills will be left out in the cold in round one. So then that begs the question, well, maybe you move back, and maybe you look at that second tier of corners, because there is a second tier of corners that are expected to go in round two, very capable players. That I think if you right. get out of round two and you don't have a corner yet, then it's a problem. Then it's a problem. So maybe this discussion about trading back into the top of round two, there might be some merit to that. Get the corner you need, and then at the bottom of round two, get somebody else that's of interest to you, whether it's you know a swing tackle, a linebacker, an, you know, an offensive lineman. I mentioned a swing tackle. Or, or if there's an edge guy that's interesting to you, you know, bottom of round two, maybe that's an option. But uh, we'll have to – I mean, it's so much more of a guessing game when you're picking at 30 than even at 12, yeah. 13, 14, where the Bills have been in recent years. All right, yeah. good discussion there. Let's spin this now, Steve, into the numbers game. Over the last 10 years in the draft, what do you believe was the most popular position pick with the 30th overall selection, Steve? It is time for you to guess – Let's fire up the music for the numbers All game. Right. So basically between 2010 and 2020, the most popular position picks with the 30th overall selection 
in the NFL draft? Give me the position right. you think was most Not popular. position group. It's got to be. It's got to be guard or tack. It can't be like O line, right? I got to say position group. Uh, I'll let you pick. I'll All let right. you pick O line as a whole, start, but that's the only position I'll, I'll give you. I'll start O line as a whole. I think that's probably right around a spot where you can get a guy that can play. And it is not in one of the top six really? positions. Is that unbelievable? Okay. For, or, and that's only from 2010 to 2020. Right, We're right, only right. talking about this 10-year range right, it's not here, offensive lineman. But I not a say, single offensive lineman in the last 10 years I has will, been taken with the 30th pick. I'll say tight end. Tight end is another buzzer, Steve. Absolutely really? no tight ends taken with the 30th pick in the last 10 years. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Here, let me just... I'm going to say wide receiver. Wide receiver tied for fourth. So I guess we can give you half a ding on that. Here's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm, I'm, here's my mind, train of thought. Who's been picking 30th or around there for the last 10 years? The Patriots have been in there. I'll give you the teams. You know? okay? okay. I'll give you the rundown of the teams from 2010 through 2020. The teams that picked 30th. Okay. 2010, it was Detroit. 2011, okay. it was the Jets. 2012, San Fran. 2013, St. Louis, now the L.A. Rams. 2014, San Fran. 2015, Green Bay. 2016, Carolina. 2017, Pittsburgh. 2018, Minnesota. 2019, the Giants. And last year, Miami. You know what I'm going to say? But there has only been one wide receiver taken in the last 10 years at pick 30. And that's tied for fourth? And his name was A.J. Jenkins from San okay. by San Fran. I will accept that. That was a bust. Um, yeah, right. Uh, you know who I'm going to say? Quarterback. Not quarterback. No quarterback oh, taking God. Steve. You are struggling I out thought of the I got here. it. I thought, you know, the Pittsburgh, you know, I, okay. Uh, tied in, wide receiver, quarterback. All right, linebacker. Linebacker tied for second on the list. Two linebackers taken in the last 10 years with pick 30. I'll give you the linebackers. 2013, Alex Ogletree by okay. St. Louis. Right. Good player, long career. And 2017, this was a hit. T.J. Watt by the Steelers. Wow. 2017. Okay. That was a winner. Swine. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right, so you got you got a good one. And one in the top two there. Tied for second. Linebacker, 18% of the picks. Defensive pick tackle. Defensive tackle tied for second. Two of them. That's, um, that's with outside with linebacker. Yeah. So you've got two defensive tackles taken with the 30th pick in the last 10 years. Muhammad Wilkerson to the Jets, 30th overall. And then current Buffalo Bill Vernon Butler, taken with the 30th pick overall by the Carolina Panthers in 2016, coming off their Super Bowl appearance in okay. 2015. All right. So two defensive tackles taken in the last 10 years. Two linebackers taken in the last 10 years, one wide receiver. Now, there is another position group that is tied with linebacker and defensive tackle with two such players at that position. And there is a number one spot with three players taken at that position. I will say safety. Safety is the one position tied with those other two, linebacker and okay. defensive tackle. Two safeties taken. Demarius Randall in 2015 by Green Bay, and Jimmy Ward in 2014 taken by San Fran, still playing for them. There's only two positions that it can possibly be now going forward. Okay. It's got to be either corner or edge rusher. Okay. Defensive end. What? Which do you want to go with, Steve I'm Tasker? Gonna, I'm going to flip. Let's make I'm a deal. Flip the proverbial coin and say cornerback. And you would be a hundred percent correct, which is why I did this in the first place. Cornerback. The most popular position that. in the last 10 years at pick number 30. Now, I'm going to wow you even more. Okay. The three corners were taken in each of the last three drafts really? at pick 30. So wait, let the me The last think. three years in a row, pick 30 was a corner. I'll never get it. I'll never get it. Well, the last year, I think you can get it. It was Miami picking 30th. Oh, uh, Do you remember who they Howard? took? Nope. The cornerback from Auburn. Got an impossible name, Noah Igbenogany. Oh, Igbenogany, that's right. Yeah, pick 30. He's a pretty good player. The year before, the Giants take DeAndre Baker. Would never corner. have gotten that. And then the year before that, Minnesota takes Mike Hughes, the cornerback. I think out of Central Florida or South Florida. Wow. Um, the last three years in a row, the 30th pick could be four in a row. was a corner. Will the Bills? 
make it four in a row? That is the question. Will they? Pick Isn't that third? tantalizing? Will, yes, it Knowing is. Knowing the last three years in will a row. They, will they pick a corner? Will they pick at 30 is an even bigger question. Well, that question. is the bigger question because I'm telling you, Steve, I think the run's going to start in the early 20s on I corners. Do too. And what does Brandon Bean do at that point? Does he make a move he, and go up and probably part with draft capital for 2022? That, I think that's what he's going to have to do to get up there. Yeah, I do too. I don't know if, it's, I don't know if it'll be worth it. Well, they it depends what they think of the second tier that's of corners. Right. That is, yes, that's correct. Second, t- second tier is second tier. Now, maybe if there's a first tier guy that sneaks down and drops to, he's not going to jump up ahead of those guys. You just it's not going to spend it. Let me ask let me ask you this quickly because I know we have to get to our uh, our interview this week. Uh, what do you think are the most worthwhile positions to trade up for in round 1? Quarterback is obviously one. Are there others worth trading up for to get? Yeah, they're in impa- this the impact positions. It's got to be defensive end pass rusher or it's got to be a corner. So you say corner is in that category, okay? For that kind of guy, yeah. But I, even so, usually it's like this year. There's five of them. Mm. So if you're close enough to jump up there to get the guy, you can get a guy similar with similar skill sets, just sitting sitting tight and moving up half that way. I wouldn't jump. You know, I'm talking like a top five jump. Yeah. You know, and to get in the top five, you got to be in the top ten or top fifteen. Right. You're not going there. And you're going to package a ton of guys. I think the Bills are capable of sliding up three, maybe four spots without right. parting with too much. But if you have to get up seven or eight spots, now you're getting into a dangerous area where you're, it's a you're kind of mortgaging the future a little bit. It's a lot of capital. And it's going to be interesting to see if Brandon Bean does, in fact, decide to make right. such a decision. Good job, Steve. Now it's time for our guest. It's NFL Network draft analyst and former Buffalo Bill, Bucky Brooks. Bucky, how you doing, man? It's good to have you with us. Hey, Bucky. so glad to be on. Good to see you guys. Yeah, so look, we want to jump right into this. I mean, we were looking at some of your uh, most recent mocks, and I know you've got uh, Elijah Molden uh, going to the Bills as one of the options there. And, you know, we were talking about him on the show yesterday because you look at the Bills and they played 90% of their defensive snaps in nickel last year, far and away the highest percentage of any team in the league. And Molden, with his compact frame, looks like the kind of guy that could almost be sturdy enough to play. And I know he's undersized for a hybrid linebacker position, but I think he's a guy that can kind of give you coverage on a slot, but can also double as, you know, that hybrid linebacker type in a nickel front like the Bills play so often. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know if he's quite big enough to be like that 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 classic like nickel backer or that guy, but I do believe he is the best nickel defender in the draft. And I think he comes with outstanding pedigree because his dad, Alex Moden, played in the league for a long time. When you look at Elijah, Elijah plays like he's a 10-year vet uh, at the position. He understands uh, where he's supposed to fit. He plays with great instincts and awareness. He's tough. He's physical. Uh, he brings a lot of tools um, – to the table and the thing about that position a lot of times it's been viewed as a throwaway position in the past but i think you have seen as you attested to 90 percent of the defensive snaps the bills have played on defense have been in nickel uh the nickel position is another starter you need to have someone who has a high degree of skills um to be able to play and function in today's game when you're seeing so many teams trying to create mismatches not only with receivers but with the tight ends as, as well when you see these prospects at the top of the draft, and I know it's difficult when you start ranking players from different positions and how good a pro they're going to be. And I think that's what you do is, you know, everybody looks at these players and that this guy's a best player, this guy's a different player. Even though they play different positions, that's when it becomes difficult to rank them. But a lot of people uh, have a, a player ranked at the very top of this draft in Kyle Pitts. Um, as the tight end who's going to be a generational kind of player. Um, and I, I, poop, I poo-poo this a lot, Bucky, i got to be honest with you, because I've seen great tight ends and athletic tight ends come out before. Um, what do you think about the top of this draft and the guys that are outside the quarterback position? 
Yeah, Cal Pitts is really talented. And, and Steve, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like, it was tough for me because I wrote about it last week in the notebook about him arguably being the best player in the draft when you look at his skill set. One, you're talking about someone is a 6'5", 6'6", 245, 250 pounds, running times in the four fours. But then when you watch his skill set, he's basically a jumbo wide receiver playing on the perimeter. Tremendous stop-start quickness, does a great job of creating separation against DB, safeties, linebackers. So he's a really, really unique weapon. And when he catches the ball and he makes plays down in the red zone, um, he puts a lot of stress on defensive coordinators because how do you treat him when he's on the field? Do you treat him as a wide or do you treat him as a tight end? Who do you want to put in the game? Nickel, dime, base. Um, makes it really, really complex. But when you think about the guys who have dominated position of late, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, those guys were later round picks. George Kittle, later round pick, fifth round or whatever. And so as much as I love him, as much as we've celebrated him as being kind of a, a gold jacket type guy in terms of a generational talent, yeah, we'll see. Because the last times that we've seen tight ends taken in the, in the top 10, they certainly haven't played to expectation. We'll see if he goes to a place that fits what he can do. Yeah, and with that in mind, Bucky, uh, for the first time in a long time, the Bills are picking after every one of their division rivals, and the Dolphins and the Jets, as you know, have two picks before the Bills are even on the clock in the first round. Two picks each, uh, and as we know, New England picks at 15, at least right now. So with that in mind, I mean, the Dolphins at six could be in play for somebody like Pitts, but how do you see the Dolphins and the Jets utilizing their first round draft selections this year to try to close the gap on the bills who are the defending division champs. Well, I think it'd be very, very similar to how the bills kind of put themselves in the position to pick 30th. Um, the bills identified their quarterback. They got Josh Allen. And in the next two years, they made sure that they built the offense around him and not necessarily making Josh more important than the rest of the team, but it's very clear and apparent they wanted to upgrade the weapons on offense to help the quarterback play at a higher level. And so I would expect the Jets, one, to identify their quarterback. We assume it's going to be Zach Wilson. And then, two, to put weapons around him to allow him to play at a higher level. The Miami Dolphins took their quarterback last year with Tua Tungvaluwa. This year is about adding weapons around him to see if they can get him to play up to expectation. Uh, when you're the Buffalo Bills and you're sitting at 30, and part of the reason you're sitting at 30 is because you won the division, you won games, and you advanced in the playoffs, that's, that's part of the deal. And so now is how can you stay one step ahead of the curve? And so that is maybe a little different mindset and mentality, but when you win, that's kind of what comes along with it. How do you stay ahead of the rivals while picking at the bottom of the round each and every round? And so in that case, how is it slightly different for New England who looks like they have Cam Newton on board at the very least to serve as a bridge quarterback, perhaps, but they only have one first round pick. They don't have multiple picks in a round until round four. How, how is the task different for new England? Maybe as compared to Miami and the jets in terms of catching back up with Buffalo. Well, I mean, I think the Patriots are a team that this off season, they made a flurry of moves to really um, fix the defense by bringing in veterans. I have a personal belief Bill Belichick is better with veterans than younger players um, because they allow, it allows him to be multiple on defense and do some of these snowflake game plans that they like to utilize. Offensively, they have to figure out who they are from an identity standpoint. Cam Newton came in, gave them um, some good work early, had the COVID situation, didn't quite play the same, but look, he still scored 12 rushing touchdowns. And so if you're Josh McDaniels and Bill Belichick, how do you take advantage of Cam Newton's skills in year two with the full offseason and those things? More weapons are needed on the outside. Julian Edelman retires. They have Nelson Aguilar. They bring over Kendrick Bourne, but they still need another piece, I would say, offensively, because the two tight ends that they signed in free agency, Hunter Henry and John Smith, they're problematic for opponents. And so I would expect this to be a team that is a thorn in the side of the Buffalo Bills. I think Buffalo overtook the division. They will have to fend off the Patriots and the rest of it to retain uh, their hold on the crown. One of the reasons I like having you on the show, Bucky, is because you agree with me on so many fronts. So <laughs> um, I'm going to say this. You, your mock draft, you've got Mac Jones falling all the way down to the Buccaneers at 32. And, and we've said this all along. A lot was made of the trade-up by the 49ers to get to number three. And there was a lot of smoke and mirrors about them taking Mac Jones. 
uh, being interested in Mac Jones. They did it for a quarterback, no question about it. But I have long, from the day one, I said there's no way they're moving up to take a quarterback who doesn't check a lot of physical boxes. It's got to be Fields or Trey Lance at number three. And you've got, you know, how far down, and if it was a perfect world, how far down the board would Mac Jones fall uh, in this draft if it was strictly a, a draft on physical traits? I mean, if it was strictly on physical traits, like he's not in the same category as the top four. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, uh, Trey Lance, and Justin Fields, in whatever order, they all have, like, superpowers, as I would say. Like, you right. guys sit and watch it every Sunday with Josh Allen. Josh Allen's physical ability, his a combination of athleticism and arm talent, he allows you to expand your playbook. He allows the play caller to get away with some erroneous play calls because he can make them right. And at a time in this game where the pass rushers are – Look, they're like superheroes leaping tall buildings in a single bound. You have to have someone that can escape and create and extend plays and offer these second reaction plays. And with Mac Jones, he doesn't offer that. And so it just becomes increasingly tougher to play with those kinds of guys at the position. It doesn't mean that he can't be a first rounder. Um, it just means that if he is your first round pick, if he's your franchise quarterback, man, the margin for error at the rest of the positions and the play calling, is so slim that you have to be dialed in and on your game each and every week. I know a couple of weeks ago you put out, you know, your top five at position uh, on NFL.com, and I immediately gravitated to the edge defender group because where the Bills pick at 30, knowing there aren't truly elite top 10 pass rushers in this class, it's very interesting to me how those guys are going to fall, whether they're going to all come off the board in a jumble Uh, I'm sure they differ in terms of grade from team to team and who likes who better. But did Jalen Phillips, who you have as your number one guy, at least you did two weeks ago, I don't know if that's changed, but after his pro Mm -hmm. day, did he solidify himself at at the top of that top tier? You know, I think on the field he would solidify himself as one of those guys because this was a guy, you have to remember, he was a top-ranked recruit, maybe number one recruit coming out of high school. He has always been lauded for his athleticism and those things. When you watch him in Miami, what he's become is really a technician. His hand skills, his combination of uh, understanding which moves are necessary to defeat certain blocks, he has it. And then when he comes up on his pro day, it just kind of confirms what you thought about him as an athlete. And it's rare that you get a high-end athlete who's also a very refined technician. That said, he has some injury issues in the past. Um, He has some concussions and some things that he had to deal with when he was at UCLA, and there's some people that will just kind of wonder whether that fit when it comes to the risk reward scenario. But this is an outstanding player. I mean, he is a he is a dynamite player as an edge defender. Bucky, one last one for me. Uh, you know, so much about this draft is set up in the free agent process, running up to it. We saw and we knew that there was a bunch of teams, uh, Chicago, Carolina, that were in the market for a quarterback like Jacksonville is going to get, and and the Jets, of course, now. And the only reason the Jets are is because they traded Darnold to Carolina. What do you think Carolina is going to do offensively, or how do you think Sam Darnold will look in Carolina with Matt Rule as his head coach in that offense? You know, I would expect now that Carolina secured the quarterback, I would expect them to turn their attention to maybe getting the offensive tackle, fixing the offensive line, making sure that, okay, now that you have him, let's let's treat this like a game of chess. Let's make sure we protect the king. Let's make sure that he is able to throw comfortably from the pocket and not necessarily have to deal with the duress and the pressure that he had to deal with when he was with the Jets. For Sam Donald, from a personal standpoint, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a low-risk proposition for the Carolina Panthers because – the money has pretty much been paid out by the Jets. Yes, they can pick up the fifth-year option, but if you do the math, that equates to two years, $11 million per year. That's not significant money for a starting quarterback, regardless of how well he plays and does that. What I am interested to see is how is he going to fit in with his offense under Joe Brady? Can Joe Brady make it a quick rhythm offense but also mixes in some play action? Can they run the ball and take the pressure off of him? He has not been great when having a lot on him. I do believe that his best football could be ahead of him, though. Bucky, as always, we thank you for the insight. Uh, We know you pound this out 365 days a year, so we're more than happy to tap into the knowledge. Thanks for giving it to us. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, guys. 
All right, Steve, so we close up this episode of One Bill's Light with the question, should we be concerned? As we discussed at the top of the show, there's a real chance that the value at cornerback might not be there at pick 30 as the anticipated run on that position, likely to begin in the early 20s somewhere with cornerback needy teams like the Titans, Jets, Steelers, Jaguars, even the Saints and the Packers at 28 and 29, all picking right in front of Buffalo. Should we be concerned? There's always a concern that <clears throat> a player that you c- might have, could have gotten early in the draft is going to be gone, You're, that the position group that you really like to get a guy in uh, is gone. Maybe there's even <clears throat> a luxury of having a kind of a group of guys like at one position at cornerback or at defensive end or defensive tackle, a group of guys that you would take any one of the group. All of a sudden, there's a run on those guys. So, yeah, yeah, it's a concern. Whenever you're drafting down lower in the draft, it's harder to get a player that's impactful for your squad. Also, given the fact that if you're drafting 30th, usually, and you earn that spot, your roster's too difficult for a young guy like that to make if he's not a top talent. We know in two of the last three drafts over which Brandon Bean has presided on behalf of the Bills, he has traded up. Um, Trading back has not been a part of his repertoire to this point. So you wonder which way does he go if the run starts? Does he try to join the party and part with some future draft capital? Or does he like the second tier of corners enough to slide back into the second round and get the top of the second tier group and get a corner there that can compete for a starting job with the likes of Levi Wallace and Dane Jackson? We shall see. Edge Edge rusher is the other popular position. Many think the Bills should address at pick 30 in light of the lack of pass rush production last season. Most outside observers believe corner or edge rusher are the most likely positions at pick 30. If for some reason it can't be or isn't, would you like them to take the best player on the board or is it time to move back and add some picks? So, Corner, edge rusher, the options aren't good. What do you do? Do you take best player on the board, or are you inclined to move back, Steve? You are Brandon Bean. Put your GM hat on. I, I, no, I'm, in, I'm not inclined to move back. You're up in the draft. You got, if you get a great deal, yeah, of course you do. I mean, you don't turn down a deal that you like. But um, there's always offensive line that can, be, can, can, that can be added. There's always another skill set that can be added. And you're going to get a good player who's going to put together a really pro career at number 30. There's been some guys who have had – fantastic right. careers so uh i i would say no i i would let the the phone ring i wouldn't try to trade out of the pick i would have a guy on in mind whether it's an offensive lineman even a linebacker whatever whatever the position i would i would make the pick i think that the phone will be ringing i do too uh we often see at the bottom of round one teams move out because there are other teams eager to move in and beat the teams at the top of the board on day two to players that they covet. And we see that almost every year. Somewhere between 28 and 32, some of these teams near the top half of the second round say, I got to leapfrog, you know, uh, whoever, Jacksonville, with their first pick on day two, if I'm going to get this guy. Let me call the Bills at 30, see if I can get up there and get this guy we really want. Oh, we got to really sweeten the pot here to make this happen. You know what I mean? So I... I think there's the phone's going to be ringing. Brandon Bean's phone's going to yeah. be ringing before he is on the clock, and he's going to have some options, I believe. I so. don't have a problem doing that, trading out of the top, because your roster is so well put together right now. In a, in a perfect world, it would be different if the cap hadn't been chopped by $30 million, because then the Bills would have the flexibility and would, could have signed some other guys, some Correct. more quality guys, to fill the roster before the draft. Yes. Um, that's the issue this year. So perhaps I'm a little bit more willing to, you know, to add some ca- some draft picks than I that I would have been able to say no, I don't need them this year because I've got some guys this year. I don't know the draft picks may be more valuable, so we'll see if he picks up the phone. It's going to be really interesting to see if Brandon Bean takes an about face from his normal mo that we've come to expect from him, which is usually going up the board. Does he right. go the other way this year? Uh, Steve and I will be slicing that probably a thousand ways between now and the 2021 NFL Draft on April 29th, live in Cleveland. That's going to do it for this edition of One Bill's Light. Be sure to subscribe so you know when our next episode drops. And remember, when there isn't enough time for One Bill's Live, there is always enough time for One Bill's Light. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. We'll see you next time, everybody.